There are certain organizations around the nation that are stepping up to champion the vision and the values that have made this country great. I'm happy to be with the Georgia Public Policy Foundation today because it's one of the best of those groups. I come to you today from Arlington, Virginia, just across the river from the land of the government shutdown. When the Pope was asked how many people work at the Vatican, he thought for a moment and answered, about half. <laughs> well, about half, I think, would be a generous estimate when it comes to those working in the federal government. The growing frustration American, Americans feel towards their government is understandable. Government in America at every level has grown too large, too unresponsive, and at the same time too meddling and too petty, but no more so than in the area that I will speak with you about today, in the private economic affairs of all of us. We now have gotten to the point where the government is shutting down lemonade stands set up by kids, requiring licenses of adults who are merely holding a yard sale. Do we need any better indication that the government has grown too big for our own good? So let's talk this morning about economic liberty, the right of every individual to earn an honest living and the occupation of their choice free from excessive and arbitrary government regulation. And let's talk about how we share that topic with others. But let's not talk like policy wonks. Let's not talk about this issue like conservatives typically do, using only numbers and data alone, using pure logic and reason. Let's put a human face on the issue, or many human faces on the issue. Let's look at what's happening across the country and back here in Georgia. And by all means, let's point out to our lawmakers a better way, a more fair and just way, a more constitutional way, in short, a more American way of looking at the rights each of us are supposed to enjoy, the rights of economic liberty and economic opportunity. And now to put my client to the test. There we go, he's on the ball. The Institute for Justice has litigated for more than 22 years in defense of ordinary Americans who have come up against government-imposed roadblocks to the pursuit of a better life through honest work. I've been at IJ for more than 21 of those years, helping these clients to argue their cases in the court of public opinion. What we find is fairly consistent from one state to another. The government too often is playing favorites, using its powers to protect the politically powerful from competition, while trampling on the constitutional rights of the least of our brothers, those without political power or influence, but who have aspired to a better life through the sweat of their own brow. But if the Constitution means anything, if the ideal of the American dream means anything, the rights of those individuals without power or influence should be just as respected as those with lobbyists and political connections. Unfortunately, tragically, what we see is that in industry after industry, they rush to the government begging, please regulate us. What they're saying in effect is we got here first. Use your power to pull up that economic ladder so others can't compete with us. Pass laws that impose licenses to protect us from others. Pass laws to impose arbitrary educational requirements that limit competition. Put a cap on the number of people who can practice my trade so I don't have to compete against them. But this is not the proper role of government. Government in America is supposed to protect our rights, not protect the powerful from honest competition, not limit opportunity, the opportunity to learn and work and prosper. The Institute for Justice did a series of studies looking at economic regulations in cities across the nation. This video tells a story of what we found. Just about everyone knows that government at every level is requiring more and more Americans to get a government-issued license before they can earn an honest living. 
In the 1950s, well, only about one in 20 Americans needed the government's blessing to do their job. Today, that number is more than one in three, and government puts all kinds of requirements on would-be entrepreneurs, making it harder for these entrepreneurs to start and grow small businesses. Entrepreneurs like Chuck here. This is Chuck. Oh, Chuck hates his job, but Chuck has an idea. I'm going to fix computers in my garage and sell them for low prices. Uh, Chuck. My business will create new jobs for my community. Chuck, old boy. And give more young people access to computers. And then once my business really gets going, I can expand into a commercial space and... You live in Milwaukee. So? Actually, in Milwaukee, starting a business in your home means you can't work in your garage, can't have any employees, can't have any signs, and can't take deliveries. What? Unless you come up with the money for a commercial lease right away, you won't be starting your business at all. Well, if Milwaukee won't have me, I'm going to start my business somewhere else. That's the spirit. What Los Angeles needs is a good used bookstore. Actually, believe it or not, Los Angeles treats used bookshops like they were strip clubs or gun shops. You'll need a permit from the police to operate. You'll have to be fingerprinted. Anyone who sells you books may need to be fingerprinted, too. For every book you buy, you'll have to stamp it with an individualized number that corresponds to a bill of sale that identifies the book and who it came from. The police get to inspect those bills of sale and hold on. You'll also have to hold books for at least 30 days before you sell them, just in case the police have any questions. But the First Amendment to the Constitution protects my... The First Amendment? Well, how quaint. And hey, you're not planning on selling that copy of the Constitution to anyone, are you, Chuck? No, oh, for Pete's sake. Balloon advertising? Well, that's an idea that's on the rise. Hmm, maybe you're onto something here, Chuck. But remember, Chuck, entrepreneurs aren't the only ones who have ideas. Bureaucrats have them, too. Here in Houston, you're only allowed to use balloons to sell cars, or if you have a message that doesn't sell anything at all. That's ridiculous. Hmm, you're right. All balloons now banned in Houston. Maybe Houston just ain't your kind of place, Chuck. How about DC? Oh, wanna be an interior designer, huh? Not too bad, not too bad at all. But in Washington, D.C., you'll need a license before you can tell people where to put those paintings, pillars, and planters. But that doesn't make any sense. Actually, that makes a ton of sense. And dollars, too. You see, existing interior designers lobbied the city to make all new interior designers, but none of the current ones, take a test and pay a bunch of money to go into the interior design business. It's a win-win for the industry and the government. Interior designers get to keep out the competition, and government gets to make money. Don't go ruining a good thing by trying to lower prices for consumers now. Now you're talking, Chuck. Miami. Nice and sunny down there. Valencia oranges and lots of tourists, too. You want to be a street vendor, huh? Well, you just need to get a little old permission slip from the city government. Ready, Chuck? Let's go. Here's all you'll need. An occupational license from the city of Miami. An occupational license from Miami-Dade County. A license from the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation if you want to sell prepared food. Or, if you want to sell pre-packaged food, a license from the Florida Department of Agriculture. Or if you want to sell gum, another license from the city of Miami. A city of Miami tax certificate. A state of Florida tax certificate. A certification from the Florida Department of Revenue that all your taxes have been paid. A copy of the current Florida Department of Motor Vehicles registration for your cart. A license plate for your cart. A cart certification form signed by three different bureaucrats from three different departments. And $500,000 and insurance coverage for any bodily injury or property damage caused by your vending. Got all your paperwork together, Chuck? Yes. Great! Now you're entitled to enter the street vendor lottery. If you're lucky enough to win, you'll be allowed to start your business. And the winner is... Oh! Not you! Tough luck, Chuck. This is still Chuck. He still hates his job. Any ideas left, guy? Oh. I'm just going to sell the leftover stuff from my computer business and go back to my old job. Uh, actually... What? If you want to close a business in Milwaukee, you'll need a government-issued license for that, too. And you'll have to give the government an itemized inventory every day of everything you're selling. Sorry, guy. That's just the cost of doing business. Or of, uh, going out of business. Oh, I just give up. Excellent. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go fix this unemployment problem. Want to help people like Chuck? Visit www.ij.org to learn more and support IJ's work protecting economic liberty. Did you feel for Chuck? And why?
because we didn't use data about licensing. We introduced you to a character who aspires to something better, but finds the government in his way. Think about how much better, how much more dynamic our communities would be if decisions about our private economic lives weren't made in the state house or in the city council, but in your house. What kind of freedoms would we see ignited because of that freedom? You'd see factories rise. You'd see entire new communities developed. You'd see once abandoned storefronts filled with new enterprises. And you have no better example of this in the entire nation than right here in Atlanta with a fight of Larry Miller. This is Larry Miller. For the past 20 years, Larry has provided for himself and his family as a vendor. Larry has worked day in and day out in the Atlanta heat and humidity, hauling t-shirts, hats, foam fingers, water bottles, and more to sell to the fans of the Atlanta Braves and the Atlanta Falcons. You may think, what kind of a difference can selling a few water bottles make in the life of an ordinary, Americans, an ordinary American? Well, let me tell you, over the years, through these humble sales, through this dignified daily work, Larry has provided a good income for himself. Through the profits of that work, he has purchased a home where he has raised children and grandchildren. Through his vending, he has hired relatives and other people who have been down on their luck and in need of work, so they too, through their own efforts, could, could provide for themselves. Each day, Larry Miller demonstrates the power of one entrepreneur doing simple, good things that any American should be free to do. What could be more simple? But the city of Atlanta doesn't see it that way. Atlanta set up a sweetheart deal with a company to erect cramped kiosks citywide and force vendors, every single vendor, to operate out of them if they wanted to sell. Would these stands be free to use? Nope. Vendors who make a living earning nickels and dimes and occasionally dollars would be forced to pay the government up to $20,000 a year to operate out of these cramped and inconvenient stalls. The kiosks were a solution in search of a problem. So Larry did what any good American would do when faced with this kind of a threat. He filed a lawsuit. And in the past, this past December, Larry won. Larry earned a clear court ruling saying that there was no justifiable reason for the city to force vendors into these stands. The victory was clear. Economic liberty should prevail. But what was Atlanta's response to this ruling that merely said that the kiosks were a no-no? The city government set out, set, set out police officers across the city to shut down each and every vendor, going so far as to even throw one vendor in jail when he verbally objected to being thrown out of business. So as of right now, vending across the city of Atlanta in any public space is against the law. So far, the mayor, has defied three specific court orders designed to help the vendors get back to work. Now think about what that means for Larry Miller, who invested thousands of dollars in his own money to sell these items at each and every Braves game and other special events across the city. All of these items he needs to sell to support himself, to put food on his table, to put other people to work, to support his family, lay stacked in a warehouse gathering dust. And why? Because the city of Atlanta thinks that it should have the power to tell people like Larry whether they should be allowed to earn an honest living. Larry is not alone. This kind of human drama pitting the individual against the state or the city or the federal government is being played out in millions of different variations on the theme each day by entrepreneurs who want nothing more than to be left alone. But outside of vendors, these barriers to honest enterprise are only necessary for dangerous occupations, right? The licenses are needed only for jobs that are a clear threat to public health and safety, you think, right? Well, let me tell you about some people whose occupations are so dangerous. They are such a threat to society that the state of Louisiana has demanded that they license their hands with the government before they practice their daring and treacherous trade. Am I talking about secret agents? Yes.
Yes, I am. But to the outside world, these secret agents are disguised as? Floris. <laughs> yes, that's right, Floris. You may sell a rose in Louisiana, and you may sell baby's breath in Louisiana. But the moment you bring them together, you're violating the law unless you have a government-issued license from the state. <laughs> government-issued license from the state to sell florist. How hard could that be to get? It was, it was statistically harder to pass the Louisiana floristry exam than to pass the state bar. A higher percentage of people pass the bar in Louisiana each year than pass the floristry exam. And why was that? After capturing the licensing board, the floors then put themselves in the position to grade the exams of their would-be competitors. Judges failed test takers if an arrangement didn't meet completely subjective standards, like having a proper focal point. Now, you could own a floor shop in Louisiana so long as you had a licensed florist on staff. The government licensed florist didn't need to do any actual work at your shop. They didn't need to do the arrangements themselves or oversee the arrangements, they just had to be on your payroll. So what difference would it make for someone to try and fail and never get into business as a florist to provide for herself? Let me tell you the story of Sandy Meadows. Sandy was our lead client in a major federal lawsuit in Louisiana. Sandy didn't have the luxury of being highly skilled or educated like many of us in this room. She had a tough blue collar life, in fact, she was a high school dropout from Mississippi, and when we first met her, she was recently widowed. She moved to Louisiana with no vocational skills other than the fact that she was good at arranging flowers, and she loved to do it. She got a job at Albertson's floral department in Baton Rouge, and she was good enough that they promoted her to manager. Sandy tried to pass the state floristry exam five times and failed. Not surprisingly, for the reasons I explained before, she failed every single time. Not because she wasn't good at arranging flowers. Remember, she got promoted to manager. But because the test was deliberately designed to allow existing florists to limit competition. Sandy got fired during our lawsuit because the florist police, yes, there were florist police in Louisiana, cracked down on Albertsons. The store needed someone with a license, and so they were forced to fire Sandy. So Sandy was jobless. And the last time our lead attorney on the case saw Sandy was when he went to her apartment in Baton Rouge. It was a semi-assisted living facility for the poor. She was lying on a couch in a common area with a set of surgical staples across her stomach from a recent operation. She was lying there while a neighbor fanned her. She was outside of her apartment because her electricity had been cut off. She didn't have enough money to pay her utility bill. Our attorney said it was about 100 degrees, and it was obvious to him that Sandy was in a lot of pain. He put Sandy in his car and drove her to a local grocery store to stock her empty cupboards. He paid $150 out of his own personal checking account to get her electricity turned back on. Then he took her to a hotel and checked her in so she could have air conditioning and at least one night of comfort. They were supposed to do the depositions the next day, but it was obvious that Sandy was in so much pain that that wouldn't happen. Our attorney returned to D.C. A few weeks later, he found out that Sandy died. She died alone and in poverty, unemployed and broken. Why? Because the state of Louisiana was more concerned with protecting the power of the flower cartel than with protecting Sandy's basic right to earn an honest living. That is an absolute outrage, but that is the kind of thing that happens every day in our country when entrepreneurs have the audacity to pursue their vision of happiness against the wishes of businesses and, the, and politicians bent on preserving the status quo. Economic liberty is not some abstract idea. Economic liberty is Sandy Meadows. So is there any hope for entrepreneurs who want to fight the system and win? Let's look at another case out of Louisiana, where the monks of St. Joseph Abbey tried to sell discount caskets to the public, but were met by fierce opposition from funeral directors who tried to use government power to shut them down. St. Joseph's monastery is more than 100 years old. The monks live a simple monastic life. Like every other Benedictine order, they must be financially self-sufficient. They grow their own food, 
pay their bills, and care for the local poor. And when Hurricane Katrina destroyed the land they used to provide for themselves, they had to start a new business to pay, their, to pay for their, meat, their needs. So they started selling wooden coffins that they had made for years for members of their own order. When the public saw these simple, dignified boxes, they liked them and wanted to order them for members of their own family. For having the gall to sell discounted caskets without a government-issued funeral director's license, the monks were threatened with crippling fines and even jail time. Jail time. The state said the monks had to turn their monastery into a funeral home. Each of the monks had to become licensed funeral directors to sell what amounts to a box. But unlike in Sandy Meadows' case, when the monks sued, the court paid attention. There was judicial engagement. The courts looked beyond the empty claims the government tried to use to impose this anti-competitive law, and court after court ruled in the monks' favor. Louisiana has applied its case, has appealed its case now to the U.S. Supreme Court, and will know within a matter of a week or so whether we'll be able to set a, a, a very important national precedent protecting all entrepreneurs, including monk entrepreneurs. Let's look at more entrepreneurs who fought the system and won. First, let's look at Hector Ricketts, a van driver from New York. Hector wanted to start a commuter van service like they had back in his native Jamaica. The vans would ride regular routes, charge passengers only one dollar, and drive them wherever they needed to go within the city. But what Hector uh, soon experienced when he tried to set up a van uh, service was a uh, a terrible lesson in American real politic. The buses and trains were union dominated. The unions funded politicians who counted on the unions for manpower and votes in addition to uh, financial support. The politicians used their power to protect the unions from upstarts like Hector and anyone else who would better serve the public. Any of these individuals were out of luck and who was one of the greatest champions of the unions against us? Anthony Weiner. Laws were passed to stifle van service. Vans, if they operated at all, couldn't deviate from a limited path, and even if they wanted to drop off a female passenger at her door and watch her safely get in, rather than dropping her blocks away in a dangerous neighborhood, they couldn't do it. And the cops, at the behest of the politicians who were acting on behalf of the unions, were merciless in their ticketing of the drivers. Despite facing enormous obstacles, Hector ultimately prevailed, and his vans continue to operate to this day, not only putting people to work, but taking people to work. And there is more good news that arises out of Hector's success. Hector has become a model and a source of business for other entrepreneurs across the neighborhoods where his vans operate, thereby helping to grow the economic pie. These individuals now provide services like auto repair, and auto maintenance for his vans, restaurants and cafes uh, for his drivers and passengers, and so much more. Entrepreneurs of many races are now getting a foothold on the first rung of the economic ladder thanks to the success of a single entrepreneur, Hector Ricketts. This is a story that could and should be replicated time and again across the nation if the government would limit its regulations to those that legitimately protect the public health and safety safety and resist the urge to engage in the conspiracy of crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is exactly what Mississippi African hair braider Melanie Armstrong faced in her quest to help women across the state provide for themselves through braiding. Melanie quickly ran up against the cosmetology cartel. For Melanie to legally teach braiding, which is nothing more than the artistic weaving and braiding of hair, Mississippi demanded that she spend $10,000 and 3,200 hours of government mandated training. 3,200 hours, not one of which actually taught you how to braid hair. That is enough time to become licensed in all of the following professions. You can become an EMT, 122 hours, paramedic, 1,700 hours, ambulance driver, eight hours, law enforcement officer, 400 hours, firefighter, 240 hours, real estate appraiser, 75 hours, and hunting education instructor, 20 hours, and still have 600 hours of training left over. 
all to braid hair. Well, Mo Melanie fought the Mil uh, Mississippi's silly law and won. Today, women may braid hair if they merely register with the state. And what difference has Melanie's victory made? Now hundreds of women have stepped out of the underground economy, where they once feared that next knock on the door would be a government regulator looking to shut them down because they didn't have a license. These women now operate out in the open, advertise for clients, advertise for new employees, and little by little, lives are getting better and better as these individuals go after what they define as their pursuit of happiness. And thanks to the teamwork of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and the Institute for Justice, the same story is now true for African hair braiders here in Georgia. So if we are to persuade our fellow citizens that economic liberty and opportunity are important, we must be storytellers. And yes, we must also have data and facts. Those are important too. You need to back up your stories with context to show that the Larry Millers of the world are not alone. Facts and data can demonstrate that Larry's story represents just the tip of the regulatory iceberg that threatens to sink our economy if things don't change. In a national study IJ issued last year, we examined the effects of licensing laws in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. The report looks at more than 100 low and moderate income occupations. We're not talking about technical jobs like being a doctor or a lawyer. We're talking about jo jobs like being a barber or a preschool teacher. Here's what we found. Should you need a government permission slip before you can earn an honest living? It's called occupational licensing, and a new national report released by the Institute for Justice shows just how widespread and costly it has become. In the 1950s, only one in 20 workers needed a government license to work. Today, it's one in three. To get a license to work, the government forces you to clear one hurdle after another. Education or training, passing tests, paying fees, and more. Too often, these hurdles take time and money to jump. They make it harder and harder for people to find jobs and to build new businesses that create jobs. How much harder? To find out, we examined licensing laws for 102 occupations in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. We looked only at low and moderate income jobs like interior designers, massage therapists, and shampooers, not doctors or lawyers. On average, these licenses require you to pay $209, pass an exam, and complete more than 275 days or about nine months of training and experience. One third of these licenses take one, two, or even as many as six full years to earn. That's a lot of time and effort spent getting permission to work instead of working. And we haven't even talked about costs, like tuition for required schooling. Which states are the worst for licensing? Louisiana licenses the most lower income occupations at 71. Hawaii has the highest hurdles. And the very worst states for would-be workers have a lot of licenses and high hurdles. Arizona leads that list followed by California, Oregon, Nevada, Arkansas, Hawaii, Florida, and Louisiana. In those eight states, it takes an average of one and a half years of training, an exam, and more than $300 in fees to get a license. Unfortunately, research provides little evidence that government licensing like this makes the goods and services you buy any safer or better. Instead, it raises costs for consumers and reduces opportunities for workers. We found at least four other reasons to doubt that many of these hurdles are necessary. First, some licenses simply don't make sense. Should you really need a license to shampoo hair, be an interior designer, or work as a funeral attendant? Second, the vast majority of jobs we studied are done in one state or another without licensing. Shampooers are licensed in only five states, interior designers in only three states in D.C., and funeral attendants in a mere nine states. The question is, what's happening in states not licensing these jobs? It's hard to believe there is a dangerous epidemic of shampooing in 46 states. Licenses like these should probably be scrapped. Third, licensing requirements are often wildly inconsistent from one state to another. Take manicurists. Ten states require at least four months of training, but Iowa requires only nine days. Alaska, just three. Do manicurists in, say, Alabama and Oregon 
really need so much more training? Lowering hurdles like these would make it easier for more people to find work and create jobs for others. Fourth, the difficulty of jumping licensing hurdles often has little to do with the safety risk of the job. The hardest occupation to enter in our study is interior designer. It takes six years of education and training, plus an exam and fees, all for a harmless occupation that is practiced safely in 47 states without licensing. Compare that to emergency medical technicians who quite literally hold lives in their hands. Yet, 66 other occupations have heavier licensure burdens than EMTs, including landscape workers, manicurists, and a host of contractor designations. The average EMT spends about a month in training and takes two exams. The average cosmetologist spends about a year, more than 10 times the training of an EMT. This doesn't mean that EMTs should face higher hurdles. Other occupations should face lower hurdles, or none at all. Licensing may have little to do with protecting public health and safety, but it does protect those who already have licenses from competition. Raising barriers keeps new competitors out and prices high. If state lawmakers want to help more people find jobs, they should start by clearing away licensing barriers that do little more than protect some people from competition by keeping others out of work. Discover more at ij.org slash license to work. And here's what we found in Georgia in that study. When you compare the number of licenses Georgia imposes on entrepreneurs plus the burden uh, to secure those licenses, Georgia relative to other states actually does fairly well. Only about 13 states do better. But there's certainly still room for improvement. And let's look at a few specific examples. In Georgia, to be an EMT, as Dick mentioned in the video, um, where you are literally holding somebody's life in your hand, uh, you only need 31 days of training in the state of Georgia. Um, this does not mean that, you know, again, as Dick said, more requirements should be imposed on EMTs. If you do that, you're going to have fewer EMTs who provide a vital service. But let's compare that to other occupations like being a barber or a cosmetologist in Georgia. 350 days of training. Or to be a, a, a teacher's assistant, that's 750 days of training. Or a preschool teacher, we're talking preschool teacher. 1,825 days of training. Surely that is excessive. The answer here isn't to raise a regula regulatory barrier on EMTs, but to reduce the regulatory burden on other occupations, thereby creating opportunity. So we've put a human face on the issue of economic liberty. We've provided data that shows that these entrepreneurs aren't alone. How about, how about now providing lawmakers at every level with a guide that they can employ to make things better for every entrepreneur and business owner across the state? The Institute for Justice is Lee McGrath, our legal counsel, who is in the back of the room. Lee, if you want to stand. Okay. As, oh, fine, you applaud Lee, but not me. That's, that's fine. He hasn't even done anything yet. Uh, Lee created uh, just as a framework for lawmakers to follow. So, uh, and he'll be happy to discuss this uh, with you uh, later on than, uh, today. First, Lee suggests that as many businesses as possible should be allowed to operate in a truly free, free market. And if problems arise, then individuals can resort to private civil action. So if you hire a landscaper to do work in your yard and that landscaper doesn't do well, uh, that landscaper shouldn't need a government license to do that work, but if a problem arises, then the homeowner can withhold payment until the conflict is resolved, a private civil action. The next highest level of government involvement is inspections. Inspections are a way to ensure uh, what lawmakers and the public actually want. Say, for example, clean restaurants. The best chances of making that happening, uh, happen are through uh, inspections. Uh, if you want to clean a restaurant, you don't necessarily license the chef, you don't license the uh, dishwasher, you just conduct inspections from time to time. Next comes bonding and insurance requirements. Then merely registration with the government or some other uh, private entity uh, to pursue a trade rather than a full-blown license. 
Then there's voluntary uh, certification. And finally, you go to the highest level of actual licensure. The point here is that too often, lawmakers are using licensing as the first step when what they should be doing is using that as a last resort. So what should we encourage lawmakers to focus on when it comes to re-examining licensing laws in Georgia? As Lee can share with you later today, they should look to reduce qualifications required to be licensed. They should convert licenses to a less restrictive form of occupational regulation. And they should repeal low and moderate income licenses across the board for many occupations. None of us in this room or in a city council or in a state house have the wisdom to know the unseen potential of any new enterprise. Microsoft was started out of a home, a home-based business, which in many jurisdictions these days would actually be outlawed. But look at how that one business has transformed our society. What are the new Microsofts that arbitrary and irrational government laws are stopping here in Georgia? And don't forget about Larry Miller. Larry Miller may not be Microsoft, but he is a good man who merely wants to work and provide for his family. I hope when you leave this room today, you'll find it, you'll find some way of pitching in and helping Larry. We, and not politicians hundreds or even thousands of miles away, are in the best position to decide our own fate. We, and not politicians, know what we need when it comes to opportunity and how to plan best for our future and for our families' futures. None of us can know what tomorrow brings, but if we are diligent and responsible today, we can provide for ourselves and for those we love for tomorrow, but only if we have the freedom to act. Our nation was built by producers, by entrepreneurs who had a vision and who lived in a place of freedom. Let's never lose that tradition nor surrender that proud heritage. Thank you.